Hello and welcome to my microeconomics lecture series. This set of slides is talking about competitions. We're going to talk about the competitive market and then we're going to transition into thinking about a monopoly. So we're thinking about our two extremes. So at the one end we're thinking of a perfectly competitive market. On the other end we're, see we're thinking of a market that's dominated by a single firm. And we're going to think about the welfare implications between the two. Okay, so go ahead and go ahead and begin here. Let's get my slide set up. All right, so a recap, thinking about a perfectly competitive market. So with a perfectly competitive market, we're thinking of a situation where there's a lot of firms and there's so many firms and so many buyers that no individual firm and no individual buyer is able to influence the market price. So everybody's going to take the market price as given, as determined by the actions of the rest of the participants. That's what we mean by determined by the market. So there's going to be a, a single price that's going to be determined by the interaction of demand and supply. And a given individual competitive firm is going to compare that price to its own cost structure. And it's going to want to produce the quantity corresponding to where price is equal to marginal cost. So I say the firm must also consider the comparison of the market price to its average variable cost associated with producing that level of output. Uh, why? Well, it could turn out that the price is below average variable cost at the particular quantity that sets price equal to marginal cost. And if that's the case, the firm would definitely want to shut down. Remember, our shutdown rule is the firm's going to produce zero. It's going to shut down in the short run, exit in the long run, if the price is lower than average variable cost. Okay. So here's our picture. Our entire market is right here, our whole market. You know, we have an interaction of demand and supply that's going to pick out an equilibrium price. Here's the market equilibrium quantity. This equilibrium price, we can think of this being stretched over and compared to the cost curves of an individual competitive firm. So this firm wants to produce the quantity that corresponds to where price equals its marginal cost. So clearly for a given for a given price it's going to intersect this marginal cost curve at a different place depending on what the price is how high this price level is right uh, and that's going to give us a different uh, optimal output right we said the supply curve of the perfectly competitive firm was the portion of the marginal cost curve lying above average variable cost from here on up and then below average variable cost supply would be zero right if the price was below average variable cost the firm would produce nothing Okay, so what I've drawn here would be the rectangle corresponding, in this case, to the firm's uh, economic profits. We know there's profits because at the point where price equals marginal cost, price is also bigger than the associated average total cost, right? This average total cost is a function of this optimal quantity. We see that at this output, the price that sets price equal to marginal cost, or the output that sets price equal to marginal cost, kicks out a quantity such that the average total cost to produce this quantity is less than the price. And we know our profits are defined as price minus average total cost times quantity, this rectangle, and so we have positive economic profits. In this case, we'd expect there's going to be entry into this market. There's going to be a lot of firms that are going to be attracted to these positive economic profits. We'd expect entry that's going to cause a uh, big rightward shift of the supply curve. As you can imagine, that's going to sort of visualize this equilibrium price falling. As a matter of fact, it's going to it's going to keep falling if this particular firm is one of the most efficient is the most efficient firm in the market. Then the entry would ultimately rest, uh, would ultimately cause prices to rest at the minimum of its average total cost. And then that would give us. Uh, that's a short-run equilibrium, but that would give us the long-run equilibrium as well. Now, if this is not one of the most efficient firms in the market, we would expect the uh, entry and exit would sort itself out such that this firm would ultimately leave. So, Okay, so we can label important price thresholds on that graph. So I've been talking about a couple things. Namely, I've been talking about profits, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. I've been talking about the shutdown decision. And as just a recap, we can label this on the graph. The break-even point is always where market price equals minimum average total cost. And the shutdown price is always where the market price equals minimum average variable cost. So here's our graph. The break-even price, the place where this firm is going to get zero economic profits, is a price that cor is the price such that when price equals marginal cost, it also equals average total cost, right? So right here. All right. So the shutdown price, this would be the price at which the firm, any lower, the firm is going to want to ex or is going to shut down in the in the short run and exit in the long run. That's right here. Minimum of average variable cost. 
All right, so now sometimes there's a common misconception. So sometimes students might think that the optimal price and the, and the, the point where this firm wants to produce is like here or it's here. No, <laughs> where the firm wants to produce for a given price is the quantity such that that price is going to be equal to its marginal cost. So for a given price, we're going to move that price over. We're going to match it up with the marginal cost. And if the price was here where my cursor is, the price was right up here, then the associated quantity would be down here, right? It always, we're always going to be interested in the price and the associated quantity. What's the association rule? Through the marginal cost curve, right? Because when price is equal to marginal cost, we're going to produce the associated quantity, which would be here. All right. Okay, so the firm wants to produce the quantity where price is bigger, than, or if the firm produces a quantity where price is bigger than average total cost, the firm's going to make profits, right? Remember, profit is price minus average total cost times quantity. If price is bigger than average total cost, definitely we have positive economic profits. If price is equal to average total cost, think about that formula again. Profits are price minus average total cost. Well, if price is equal to average total cost, price minus average total cost is zero. That's breaking even. And then if price is less than average total cost, the firm is going to incur a loss, right? Because price minus average total cost is going to be negative. What's the firm going to do? Are they going to produce when they're making a loss? Well, we don't know yet. We'd have to know how price compares to average variable cost. If price is bigger than average variable cost, that loss is tolerable in the short run because essentially we'd be losing less by producing than we would be shutting down. Remember, that was the situation where that was a situation where if you think of like a cookie factory, maybe you're not able to pay the, the rent for the factory space or for your storefront or whatever, but you are able to cover the costs of uh, ingredients to make the cookies and labor to hire workers to make it and to sell them. If that's the case, you're covering your variable costs, but not covering your average total, your total costs. And so you'd produce in the short run because it, you're still responsible for your rent. You might as well make back as much of it as you possibly can. Uh, but you're going to exit in the long run. You're going to, or you're going to, you know, renegotiate. Maybe you're going to come up with a different, um, different arrangement. <laughs> Typically, though, we'd say if price is less than average total cost, that's a firm that's very likely to exit in the long run. Matter of fact, we'll just assume that they do. Um, okay. So in the long run, with a perfectly competitive industry, uh, we have the following outcome. So the value of marginal cost is the same for all firms because all are going to produce where price equals marginal cost. Uh, and all face the same market price. Therefore, the marginal cost has to be the same for all firms, right? All remaining firms in the long run are equally efficient. If they were more efficient, if there's some were more efficient than others, then the price isn't in its long run equilibrium. We'd expect it to go lower. If some were less efficient, then they need to leave the market. Right? Uh, as a consequence, further, in the long run, each firm has zero economic profit because each is producing at the level corresponding to its break-even point to the minimum of average total cost. So we get this, this equality amongst three things. Price is equal to marginal cost is equal to average total cost in the long run equilibrium. And lastly, the market outcome is efficient. There's no foregone mutually beneficial transactions. All demanders are served as long as their willingness to pay is higher than marginal cost. Remember the market outcome. It's We assume that this is efficient. Right. That was, uh, that was our assumption going back to welfare and thinking about producer and con consumer and total surplus. This was maximized with the competitive equilibrium. Okay, so now we're going to transition to something very different. We're going to think of a situation where we have a monopoly. So we have a single firm operating, and we can use a lot of the same intuition for a monopoly to think about things where firms aren't necessarily monopolies, but they have some substantial market power. So... Uh, you know, a lot of the intuition we have that we use thinking about monopolies is applicable with some necessary changes to other market structures, such as monopolistic competition and oligopoly, though there's sort of important differences with how those market structures work. Nevertheless, on sort of a local scale, scale a lot of what we're talking about monopoly is directly transferable uh, to those situations as well. Um, 
so enough about that. Uh, in terms of why there might be a monopoly, well, it could be the situation that the monopoly is uh, the single firm controls a scarce input. So, you know, if you control all the diamond mines, if you control all the diamonds, then you've got a monopoly in diamonds. It's really difficult for somebody to enter that industry. Or like uh, the aluminum company of America, so Alcoa, was sort of a famous monopoly that was able to um, control the input go that was r really important for making aluminum. Um, it could be a situation if there's increasing returns to scale. Maybe there's a technological advantage. You just have much lower costs than any others in the market. Um, it could be a situation where there's network externality. So uh, think about like Windows 95 and in uh, Microsoft. Well, there's a network externality there. What's the network externality? Well, uh, network externality refers to a situation where the value of the product to consumers is increasing in the number of other people who have who are using that good. So, think about uh, think about like the value of having uh, an email address. Well, I mean, if you have if you're the only one with email, there's some value, right? Because you can email files to yourself. Um, you know, that's kind of fun. If you have other people you can send email to, if there's other people that have email addresses, the value of having the email address increases, right? And so um, as, as more people have email addresses, the value of having one for yourself rises as well. That's exactly what we mean by network externality. Similarly, think about like having a phone, right? Is it useful to have a phone? Well, I mean, it's a nice paperweight. If other people have phones as well, the value of having a phone to you increases drastically. That's a network externality. Why does this confer monopoly power? Why is this relevant for a monopoly? Well, if you have a situation where there's a very strong network externality, like think about my win think about the example of like Windows 95 or Microsoft, like a lot of people are using particular software, um, it's really difficult for another firm to enter that market because, you know, why would anybody adopt the new entrance software when everybody they want to work with and everybody they want to send files to are using the, the other technology, right? So network externality can be very difficult to overcome. Similarly, like think about like social networking sites. So think about like Facebook, be very difficult for another sort of upstart uh, social media site to reach the level of, um, of adoption as Facebook has because virtually everybody's on Facebook. You know, you know, so very difficult to be able to overcome that very large uh, network externality, right? The value of having a Facebook account is increasing in the number of other people that have it. Uh, and so if you think of a, another alternative site, and there's many, but, um, but really difficult to sort of justify uh, adopting a, a different one because you'd have sort of much smaller uh, network externalities given the fact that you have much, it's a much smaller network, fewer people on those sites. So anyhow, network externality can confer monopoly power. And then government protection. So big, big examples of government protection would be like our standard sort of best examples of monopolies. So that would be like utilities, like the water or, um, or power, like electricity, gas. Um, government protection can also lead to monopolies through uh, through like patents, so patents or copyrights. So you know, hopefully, if if works are copyrighted, hopefully you're the only one that can that can benefit from uh, from your from your work if you hold a copyright. So you know, government protection can actually uh, be sort of a variety of things, but that can definitely lead to a situation where we have a monopoly. Okay, so a ma monopoly being uh, the only firm in the market is going to face the entire market demand curve. What do we know about market demand curves? Well. They're always downward sloping, right? That's just the law of demand. So therefore, the monopoly's demand curve is is the is uh, since it's the market demand curve, is also downward sloping. And actually, we uh, we can sort of define the condition of facing a downward sloping demand curve as having market power. So we kind of mean the same thing. Uh, not so. All monopolies have market power, but not all firms with market power are monopolies. So you can have situations where you have some degree of local market power. Uh, you have some some you face a downward sloping demand curve. You have some ability to influence the price, but you might not be a complete monopoly. So the examples would be uh, monopolistic competition or oligopoly. So those are other market structures where you'd have firms. So oligopoly would be just as it sounds. Uh, it's like monopoly, but there's more firms. So oligopoly would be a situation with a few a few strong firms with market power, typically. Uh, selling a relatively identical product, though not 
not exclusively. And monopolistic competition would be a situation where you have a lot of firms with localized market power. So you have sort of many firms, but they're each able to influence the price of their own good, though not necessarily the, uh, the, the overall uh, market price as well. So, all right, we'll see a graph for the comparison to the individual competitive firm, right? Here's the monopoly's demand curve, downward sloping. Market demand is equal to the monopoly demand. Here's an individual competitive firm's demand curve. We saw this before. Um, it's perfectly horizontal at the price that's picked out by the interaction of market demand and, and market supply. Okay, so what's the difference? Here we have one firm facing the entire market demand. Here we have one firm, but because it's in a market with many firms, it only faces, uh, it faces a horizontal demand curve, right? This is the individual competitive firm's demand. This is the monopoly's demand curve. Uh, what do we notice here? Well, the competitive firm, as it increases its output, that doesn't have any effect on price. It's a price taker. That's exactly what we mean by perfect competition. You can produce as much or as little as you want, and the price is the same. Not so for the monopoly. If the monopoly increases its output, the price has to fall. If it reduces its output, the price will rise. That's just the law of demand. So the monopoly's uh, demand obeys the law of demand. Okay. So the monopoly does not take the market price as given. It's able to influence the price. Uh, but much like a competitor firm, I say it searches for its optimal price by comparing marginal revenue to marginal cost. So it's going to optimize by producing the quantity that corresponds to where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Uh, because demand is down sloping, turns out marginal revenue is always going to lie under the demand curve. And so the price is always actually going to be something bigger. So greater than mar where the mar price is always greater than marginal revenue for a monopoly uh, and therefore greater than marginal cost. So the, so the competitive firm's optimal decision is also to produce where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. But since price was equal to marginal revenue for the, co for the competitive firm, we got price equal marginal revenue equals marginal cost for the competitive firm. So what's the commonality? Well, all firms want to produce the output corresponding to where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That's going to be true whether you have a monopoly or you have a competitive firm or an oligopoly or monopolistically competitive firm. All are going to want to produce the output such that marginal revenue is equal to its marginal cost. The competitive firm is also is this boils down to price equals marginal cost for the competitive firm. We saw that already. And for the monopoly, there's going to be a price greater than marginal cost, right? Price is bigger than marginal revenue, which is equal to marginal cost. And this is going to this is going to mean that there's going to be some markup, some uh, markup on the price for the monopoly. Okay, so the monopoly wants to produce the output where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Here I've drawn in uh, a demand curve. This is market demand. That's also the monopoly's demand. I've drawn in a marginal revenue curve. And the thing you need to know about marginal revenue curves uh, for a monopoly, if the demand is linear, then marginal revenue always has the exact same vertical intercept and exactly twice the slope, meaning that this horizontal intercept needs to be under the midpoint of the demand curve, right? So the marginal revenue curve is going to always have the same vertical intercept, but twice the slope as the market demand curve, if the demand curve is linear. All right. And the monopoly always wants to produce where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Here I've assumed constant marginal cost equal to average total cost. Marginal cost intersects marginal revenue right here, so the monopoly's quantity is here. Now we need the price. So in order to get the price, prices come from demand curves. So we got to go up to the demand curve to find the price that's associated with this quantity via demand. And that's going to be this price right here. So the monopoly price is this. Don't make the mistake of trying to label this as the monopoly's price. It's not, right? <laughs> this is marginal cost. This is the price if the market were competitive talk about that a little bit later on but again the steps for finding the from the graph what the monopoly is going to do it's going to produce where marginal revenue well marginal revenue equals marginal cost it's this quantity right here to get the price we go up to the demand curve and we find the associated monopoly's price all right now just looking ahead this box right here is picking out profits this is producer surplus remember producer surplus is the is the difference between the actual market price and costs so this is producer surplus, this is profits. This right here, under the demand curve and above the actual price, this is consumer surplus. And then this right here, this is going to be deadweight loss. Right? This will be deadweight loss. And so um, we'll go ahead and 
show I'll show that in a little bit. How do we know that's dead weight loss? Well, suppose the competitive suppose the market was served by a competitive market. Um, then price would be set equal to marginal cost optimally. Well, here, if this is marginal cost, then price equal to marginal cost means a price right here. So let's carry this down. Prices come from a demand curve, so price would equal marginal cost way out here. So the competitive output would be something out here, right? So this is showing us that the monopoly is actually going to restrict output so as to raise the price, and this whole area is going to be foregone trade. Okay, I'll talk about that in the slides in a little bit, but I want to kind of foreshadow a little bit since it might be a question we have. So, okay, so uh, monopoly maximizes profit by finding where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That's going to determine its optimal output. Then it's going to compare the output to the demand curve to determine the optimal price. And so I showed you that, the, kind of the three steps. And then profits, price minus average total cost times quantity, right? Price minus average total cost. Average total cost is this times quantity. It's profits. Profits are, are this rectangle. Okay. And just, to, just for completeness, here's the monopoly's profits. Okay, cool. So let's reflect on this in comparison to the perfect, perfectly competitive situation. So in the competitive market, the firm's going to produce where price equals, well, you know, individual firms produce where price equals marginal cost and the competitive market as a whole produces where, mar where price equals marginal cost. Um, each individual competitive firm sets price equals marginal cost and earns zero economic profit in the long run. This, but we said this is going to be efficient. This is going to maximize efficiency. As a consequence, this means that in the long run, uh, we expect there to be consumer surplus, but no producer surplus. Okay, for the monopoly, since price is bigger than since the monopoly price is bigger than marginal revenue, which is equal to marginal cost, we have price the monopoly price minus marginal cost is going to be positive. So the monopoly price minus marginal cost is positive. We're going to call monopoly price minus marginal cost markup. Right? There's no markup for the perfectly competitive market because if price is equal to marginal cost, this is zero. But for the monopoly, price is bigger than marginal cost. We know that from this statement. And it's precisely the fact that price is higher than marginal cost that yields econ positive economic profits. So how does the monopoly do this? It restricts output. So it's going to produce less. By the law of demand, prices rise. Right? That's what this was. OK, so here is the comparison between what the competitive firm would produce and what the monopoly would produce. Here's the monopoly's output. Here's the competitive market's output. The respective prices would be the monopoly's price here. I, I could label this as competitive price. I didn't. All right. So anyhow, this is the difference in the equilibrium that we'd expect with a competitive market versus the monopoly. OK. So we'll talk about welfare. So remember, consumer surplus is the difference between the willingness to pay and the market price. Uh, willingness to pay is from the height of the demand curve. The height of the demand curve gives us the willingness to pay of the marginal consumer. So the area below the demand curve and above market price is consumer surplus. Producer surplus is the difference between the market price and costs. It's going to be the area below the market price and above the cost structure, above supply. Uh, and perfectly competitive market is efficient. It maximizes total surplus. That's the sum of consumer surplus and producer surplus. So let's see this graphically. So here's the picture. Competitive market maximizes total surplus. Com competition means we're going to produce where price equals marginal cost. Prices come from demand curves. Let's see where price crosses marginal cost. It's right here. So here's our competitive quantity. Here's our competi competitive price. Uh, the whole area under the demand curve is consumer surplus. Uh, and you know that's, that is, this is a consequence of the fact that I drew a constant marginal cost. Suppose we had an upsloping marginal cost, then there would be some producer surplus. We'd expect that's okay in the short run. Um, but anyhow, so for the, I made this picture simple. I made horizontal marginal cost, constant marginal cost, uh, just to make the picture simple. But anyhow, we're going to maximize total surplus with the competitive equilibrium. So, okay. The standard single price monopoly introduces inefficiency. It reduces output relative to what the competitive market would do. Uh, this means there's going to be gains to trade that are foregone. In particular, the units corresponding to the area between quantity the monopoly would produce and quantity the competitive firm would produce are more highly valued by consumers than they cost to produce by virtue of the fact that we observe the demand curve lies above costs over those units. 
and this is what we're calling dead weight loss, right? So we're talking about this area, the area corresponding to the quantities between what the monopoly would produce and the competitive firm would produce is this triangle right here. And the height of the demand curve tells us the benefits, the margin, it's like the marginal benefits, right? It's a willingness to pay to consumers. The height of the supply curve is, remember, marginal cost is supply curve. Uh, height of the supply curve is the cost to produce. This shows the benefit to consumers is higher than the cost to produce, at least until we get to here. Now the cost to produce are bigger than the benefits. But over these units right here, the mar because the demand curve lies higher than the marginal cost curve, we know there's gains to trade. However, these trades don't happen because the monopoly wants to restri restrict output to raise the price. Okay. So monopoly profit maximization introduces inefficiency, in particular deadweight loss, which I've got in red. So this is the inefficiency due to foregone trades, the trades that don't happen when we have a monopoly but would have happened if the market was competitive. And then consumer surplus, like I said a while ago, is right up here. All right, so relative to perfect competition, where there's no producer surplus, the monopoly is able to cut into this surplus and get some profits, but it comes at the cost of uh, introducing deadweight loss. Okay. So suppose the monopoly wanted to be a little bit more efficient, <laughs> not for altruistic re reasons necessarily, but because it realizes, wait a second, there was a whole lot of surplus right here, and now surplus is less because we lost this whole area. So what what can the monopoly do to try to capture more surplus? Well, price discrimination. So first degree price discrimination would be personalized prices. So this would be the situation where every consumer is quoted a price that matches their willingness to pay. So wherever you are on the demand curve, that's your price, and that's first degree price discrimination. That requires quite a bit of information because the firm has to know how much you'd be willing to pay uh, for uh, how much everybody's willingness to pay is. Second degree price discrimination doesn't require nearly as much um, information. This is a situation where the firm is going to construct a menu of options that consumers then choose from. They self-select into, uh, into the different packages. And third degree price discrimination would be we're going to have different prices based on, well, I say relative price elasticity of demand. That's sort of a consequence of what typically happens. With third degree price discrimination, we're thinking of things where you have some readily identifiable characteristic between your consumers, like maybe they're students versus non-students or senior citizens versus non-senior citizens. Um, and so you've got you know some characteristic that is presumably highly correlated with differences in um, willingness to pay and price elasticity of demand. And so the idea is let's raise the price on those with the low price, with the, with the inelastic demand, and let's give a discount to those with very elastic demand. That's kind of how it works. So, okay, I'll talk a little bit more about each of these. First degree price discrimination involves setting prices equal to every consumer's individual willingness to pay. So, like I said, this requires kind of a lot of information, difficult to do in practice, although I guess, you know, uh, by the data collection efforts of uh, internet retailers, <laughs> this is becoming, you know, at, at least, uh, at, le at least in principle, could become a reality. Um, perfect price discrimination would convert all consumer surplus to profit. There would be no deadweight loss. So this would be like the ideal situation for the firm, right? So the entire area under the demand curve would now be producer surplus. Why? Well, what the monopoly is going to do is each person gets their own price. So whatever is this person's willingness to pay, the height of the demand curve is their willingness to pay. Whatever is this person's willingness to pay, that's their price. For this person, that's their price. For this person, it's their price. All the way down to the person that's right here. And this is this will be their price, marginal cost. And these people right down here, they're not going to be served because their willingness to pay is below costs, right? So anyhow, we get the same we get the same quantity. I, I should have relabeled this. <laughs> this is the this is the quantity for the competitive market and for the perfect price discriminator, right? Perfect price discrimination allows a monopolist to pr produce all the way down to the competitive quantity. Why? Because when it lowers its price to each individual consumer, it doesn't have to lower the price to everybody. In order for this to work, the firm has to have tremendous information about everybody's willingness to pay, and it has to be able to block resale. It has to be able to prevent resale, because otherwise, the person down here could get a really big deal 
discount and turn around and sell it to this person and capture all that surplus themselves. So you, no, there can be no opportunities for arbitrage or for resale. Right? For, for profit, arbitrage is like profitable, profitable resale essentially. So, okay. Second degree price discrimination involves setting a menu of options that consumers are free to choose from, and hopefully we construct these um, reasonably so that everybody chooses the offer that we intend for them to buy. And I'll, I'll do an example on a chalkboard at the end of the slides to illustrate this. Uh, so an example would be maybe quantity discounts or you know some type of volume pricing. Uh, maybe there's variations in quality or features. And the important part about second degree price discrimination is everybody has the ability to buy any package. It's just that people are going to buy whatever is best for them. It's different than first degree price discrimination because everybody's quoted a different price. And it's different than third degree price discrimination where you have to be in one group or the other to be able to get the to be able to get that particular price. And so I say this is useful when consumers differ in their preferences, but in ways that are difficult to observe. So you wouldn't necessarily know the distribution of preferences very well, or not perfectly anyway, and very difficult to monitor. Lastly, third degree price discrimination. So imagine you've got a demand curve that is uh, composed of heterogeneous demanders. And what you decide to do is, if you're the monopoly, is disaggregate your demand into smaller homogeneous groupings. And so the idea would be, suppose you've got a bunch of fans willing to go to a football game and you want to sell tickets to them, you can identify that some are students, some are alum, some are general public. And presumably the different identities correlate with different willingness to pay. So you can charge different prices at the group level. So you could offer different prices based on some observable, verifiable characteristic, like having a student ID card uh, or senior citizen card or something like that. And presumably, these differences are correlated with uh, differences in uh, price elasticity of demand. So remember the intuition from how you'd increase revenue according to elasticity. So if, if price elasticity of demand is elastic, very responsive, you would increase revenue by lowering price because the overwhelmingly the increase in quantity um, in response to the price decrease would uh, swamp the loss uh, per unit because of the reduced price. If you want to increase revenue and demand is inelastic, then you can raise the price and yeah, you'll sell a smaller quantity because of the law of demand, higher price, smaller quantity, but the quantity response is small relative to the larger, proportionally larger price increase. Same thing happens here. Basically, whichever group has the more elastic demand, you would give a discount to and then the inelastic demanders or the relatively inelastic demanders would have to pay a higher price. So you provide a discount to those with elastic demand that's essentially subsidized by those with inelastic demand. So reflect on why this works. I just told you the story. It's the revenue story. So. Okay, so I'm a little bit out of order on my example here. So let me try to move this to, uh, to this one. So here's our second degree price discrimination example. Uh, okay, so suppose we have two versions of a good, high quality and low quality, and consumers can buy at most one. And assume we have 100 consumers of each type. Suppose the marginal cost to produce the high quality is 40 and the low quality is 10. And um, assume we have the following marginal benefits to consumers or their willingness to pay. So um, type A consumer Suppose their willingness to pay for low quality is 40 and for high quality is 60. Type B consumer, suppose their willingness to pay for low quality is uh, 50 and high quality is 100. So people differ in terms of their willingness to pay for uh, the different qualities. So type B consumer is always willing to pay more than type A for low quality or for high quality. All right. So a couple different options. You could sell only to the low, you could only sell low quality if you wanted to. Uh, if you only sold the low quality item, it turns out your optimal price would be 40. Then you can sell that to both type A and type B, type B consumers. So you'd, you'd sell 200 because you're selling to both groups. So your profits would be 40 minus 10. 10 is the marginal cost to produce low quality. Um, so that's what, 30 times 200 consumers, so profits of 6,000. You have another option. You could sell only the high quality. So suppose we only want to sell the high quality. Then it turns out you, because the type B consumer has such a massively large willingness to pay for the high quality item, uh, we actually only want to sell high quality. Uh, to We actually only want to sell 
to the type B consumer. So sell only high quality. The optimal price is 100. Only Bs buy. And then our profits are again going to be 6,000 because 100 minus 40. 40 was the marginal cost necessary to produce the high quality version. Right? Um, so 6,000 in profits. Okay. And then the last thing we could do is we could sell both qualities. And that's where we're going to come up with a menu of, uh, of prices that our consumers are going to choose between. So go ahead and do that now. Um, I'm going to cover myself up because I want us to have these willingness to pays. So, okay. so if we sell both qualities, we're going to select the prices so that A consumers and B consumers self-select uh, the bundle that we want them to buy. So the price of the low quality is 40 uh, and it turns out optimally the price of the high quality is going to be 89 or 90. Why? Well, think about the most think about the most we can get in these two cases. Um, definitely our profits are going to come from selling the high quality uh, item to the type B consumer. So then who's going to buy the low quality item? Well, the uh, type A consumer because they're going to buy at most one. So the most we can get out of our type A consumer is 40. So let's set it a price of 40 for the low quality good. They'll buy because they're indifferent between buying and not buying and we always break the tie in favor of the economic activity. Okay. What about our type B consumer? Well, suppose we were to set a price of 100. That would seem good, except remember, we're giving a menu of options that consumers can choose between. If we were to charge a price of 100, the consumer surplus to the type B would be zero if they bought the, the high quality item, right? Their willingness to pay is 100. If we charge them a price of 100, their consumer surplus would be zero. What if they bought the low quality good for 40? Their willingness to pay was 50, they'd get consumer surplus of 10. So they'd never buy the high quality good. Matter of fact, in order to induce the type B consumer to buy the high quality good, we need for the price to be low enough that they get at least 10 in consumer surplus. So they're indifferent if we charge them 90 for if we charge them 90 for the high quality item, and they're strictly going to prefer the high quality item if we only charge them $89. Right? Consumer surplus to to be for the low quality would have been 10. Consumer surplus for the high quality is now 10 if we charge them 90. So they're indifferent. We'll break the tie in favor of the economic activity, which means break the tie in favor of the direction we want them to buy. So they'll buy the high quality. Or if, if you're uncomfortable with that, we could just make this 89 and then they definitely buy because their consumer surplus would be 11. Okay. So that's fun. Either way, um, they're so price, second degree price discrimination gives us um, an increase in profits. So our profits are 8,000, right? So 40 minus 10 times the 100 consumers, 90 minus 40 times 100 consumers, 8,000. We get a 33% increase in profit. So that's pretty cool. How do we get that? Well, remember how you get a percentage increase. So you, you take uh, new minus old divided by old times 100. So that's 33%. Right. This is actually a calculation you use all the time in macroeconomics in introduction introductory macro where you're trying to find uh, like inflation and um, uh, price changes and stuff like that. All right. So this now I want to talk about this thing that I have on the corner of the board right here. So try to zoom in a little bit. So what this is doing is I'm trying to illustrate what's going on with first degree price discrimination. So the person with the highest willingness to pay is all the way up here. The person with the lowest willingness to pay is right down here. Uh, the height of the demand curve gives us willingness to pay, and first degree price discrimination means sell to each at exactly their willingness to pay. And that allows us to, to, to uh, capture the entire area under the demand curve as producer surplus. So the quantity the competitive firm would produce is way out here. That actually turns out to be the quantity that the monopoly would produce with first degree price discrimination. And the interesting thing, of course, what's making this work is the, the monopoly will serve those consumers um, that are out here as long as, they're, as, as long as they can sell to them at a price equal to their willingness to pay, which is higher than marginal cost. That's what makes this work. And then as a consequence, we get no deadweight loss. All total, total surplus is exactly producer surplus, and there's no consumer surplus. Okay, so this was, 
what I just did right here was the first degree price discrimination story. I only want to talk about it because it's on the side of the picture. 